Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. Of course, my name is Bryce. I am back from my travels, as you can see from my actual set. I'm back in Atlanta, and so we are back to our regularly scheduled programming. Tomorrow, I will be back on with Shanti on Solutions with Aquarius Rising Africa, and then moving forward this Monday, we will be continuing with our Monday Mysteries, looking at the Romanov dynasty of Russia, which seems kind of appropriate with what's going on in the world. I didn't plan it that way, but it's just interesting how life gets serendipitous sometimes. We are obviously coming off of the Super Bowl, which frankly, I have no idea who won, nor do I care because, I mean, seriously, who watches the Super Bowl anymore? It's kind of like the Grammys and the Oscars. Like, who watches this stuff anymore? So much has happened over these last four or five years that I'm like, who actually still waste their time with that nonsense anymore there's so much more important things to be looking at that is just my opinion no offense to the football fans out there i personally am just absolutely i've never been a football fan i actually have a lot of ptsd when it comes to things like football and organized sports i just i will never date anybody who um likes to watch football because that is a hard boundary for me not a fan of that that stuff at all i have my reasons for that so no offense to those who are a fan but i just like who cares who cares all right anyway but you know what's really fascinating way more fascinating than the super bowl or the grammys or the oscars is the story of granger taylor now in the last video that i filmed very haphazardly when i was on traveling um which was the brownsville road case uh, likewise, I heard of this case while I was actually traveling. I was listening to a podcast, and I'd never heard of Granger Taylor before. Now, with that being said, Granger Taylor is from Canada, from Vancouver Island, so um, very far away from where I, I reside on the southern, eastern area of the United States in Atlanta, so definitely separated by a lot of distance. However, his disappearance is so freaking fascinating and with most disappearances in the world today we are, we're only looking at a few options right like most of the time a body will appear at some point or we have reason to suspect that maybe that person was unaliving themselves or maybe we have reason to suspect that the person that went missing was abducted there's all these different theories especially with the national parks which we've talked a lot about those national parks but with granger taylor there seems to be a different motivation behind his departure you could say he might have been abducted but he went willingly and we're going to get into this because i cannot wait like with the brownsville road episode with a lot of these cases that are still still remain kind of unsolved mysteries I cannot wait to hear your perception because this case has me stumped. And I actually can can see the different perspectives that people have on this case. I can play devil's advocate with my own self and my own opinions in this case. So I can't wait to hear what you think happened or what maybe you hoped happened. I know what I, I hope happened to Granger, but I don't know if that's actually what happened. So let's get into the story. Now, Granger Taylor, again, he was a Canadian man who lived on Vancouver Island up in Canada. He disappeared in 1980. So before I was born, before some of you watching were born. Now, as we go into this case, I have a crap ton of notes. And you guys, you know, typically when I do these deep dives, I prefer to really edit them so you don't actually see me looking at my notes but with this there's so much here and i feel like it just flows better so i apologize if you see me looking back and forth but that's just how it's going to be for this episode i'm kind of experimenting with changing up the formatting a little bit so i apologize if you see me looking at my notes um just verifying some facts here so granger taylor went missing on november 29th 1980 and he left a note for his parents granger did live at his parents house so let's get a little bit into who 
Granger was as a person. Granger seems to be or seemed to be a little bit of what we would call a savant. Now, this is just my opinion. Um, I obviously don't know Granger, never wasn't even born when he disappeared. I don't know his family, nor have I spoken to anybody associated, friends or family associated with this disappearance. So this is just my perception of looking at the case through my own eyes. I do believe maybe he was a little bit autistic, um, not not super autistic, maybe just enough where he had some kind of like social quirks about him, but he was a genius, you guys. Like this, this guy was so freaking smart. He, um, his, his, I think it was one of his siblings that called him an industrial archaeologist. And so Granger lived in this town of Duncan on Vancouver Island. And this is a very, 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 very small town. It's, it's known for logging. It's also a fishing city. It's, it's mostly working class people. Obviously it's up north of Seattle, very rainy, um, that area, not not like the islands down here in the south where I live, where it's hot as hell most of the time. So, so you know, this was a very working class, logging, logging class city, a small, small, small town. And when we talk about the disappearance of Granger, I, I was actually thinking about this in the shower this morning. We have some pros and some cons when we're dealing with small town disappearances. And the pro, pros and the cons are coming from the same thing. Like, it's a pro because when you're looking at small towns, you're looking at people, residents of the small town who known each other, known each other's families for a really long time. We're talking generations. And so people have in small towns typically have more intimate knowledge of each other, even if they're not the best of friends. And so when we're talking about Granger as a person, this is a pro because we have people that really knew who he was and we're very aware aware of his quirkiness and and therefore they're able to recognize patterns in his behavior that maybe you wouldn't recognize if if granger was living in a, in a large city i hope that makes sense this is also a con because sometimes i think we get so inundated with our own understanding of someone our intimate understanding with someone that's hard for us to actually see outside of that like we, we have some limitations that maybe there was something else going on so i just kind of wanted I, I like i said i was thinking about that in the shower this morning like pros they really knew this guy cons they really knew this guy and so when we get to to speculation on what happened i hope that makes sense that we're possibly seeing both pros and cons um, with trying to figure out what happened to Granger Taylor. Now, Granger was born on October 7th of 1948. He, um, again, was a very interesting and eccentric child, uh, very shy, possibly had a hard time understanding social cues. As I just said, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, basically no social skills, but he was really, really kind. Like nobody had a bad word to say about Granger. And I feel like, again, with these small towns, people do kind of develop, um, more care, like they, they become kind of like a character of, of themselves. I'll give you guys an example. In the, these travels, I stopped by Equipment Georgia, which is, if you guys saw the episode that Bobby did, where she did kind of a who do you think you are of my ancestral lineage and Equipment. I'll tag that in the description box below if you missed it. And I was in this small town, like walking around. I'll share that footage later in another video. And I said to my boyfriend, this town is so small and so old that it would be so easy to move down here and kind of develop a reputation for being like the town witch, you know, like being kind of like, like you, you develop these like caricatures of yourself. So in a lot of ways, when people are just des describing Granger, it's almost like, in a, and I don't mean any disrespect, but it's almost like they're describing like a character of the town. Like everybody in the town knew that Granger was super, super, super smart, but kind of eccentric, but also shy. And his intelligence didn't didn't play out in academia. Like it wasn't like he was excelling in school. His his that's why I said he's kind of a savant. His intelligence was on a very specific 
trade, a very specific craft. In fact, Granger actually left school, traditional school, in the eighth grade or grade eight, as they say in Canada. And at this point in 2024, that doesn't shock me at all. We know that at this point in 2024, kind of like the Super Bowl and the Grammys and the Oscars, like, do people actually take this seriously anymore? We now know way too much about the school system and how it's actually not teaching a lot of true information to students. So, but in, you know, when he was growing up in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, that probably wasn't an accepted reality. But he did leave at eight in the eighth grade. Sorry, not eight years old, in the eighth grade. And what his talent, he was really good at electronics. Like he seemed to understand, like I said, his sister or somebody on one of the podcast said that he was an industrial archaeologist. He had this ability of knowing, of figuring out how things were created. And I think a lot of, especially little boys tend to do this. Like when he was a kid, people said he would like take a toy or a clock or something mechanical into his bedroom and he would take it apart just to figure out how to put it back together. So this stuff really, really fascinated him. Now let's get into some of his his achievements in, in this field um, around the town, kind of what he was known for. Like he could fix anything, you guys. Like if you had a car issue, Easy peasy, he could fix it. But let's let's get into this. So when we look at his childhood, Granger's father actually died when he was a child. He died in a drowning accident. So Taylor was the last name of his stepfather who stepped in and kind of raised Granger and his siblings. His name was Jim. And when Jim and Granger's mother got married, Jim brought in children from his previous marriage as well. So he grew up with like seven brothers and sisters, kind of like the sound of music. You know, I doubt they were out there yodeling, yodeling in the, in the, in the hills. But um, but that's kind of what it reminded me of having that many siblings. I'm kind of jealous. I think that must have been really fun to grow up on a farm with seven brothers and sisters, especially in a time before social media where you were literally outside all the time. Now, again, um, as uh, uh, Jim, the stepfather, loved Granger, loved his his Granger siblings, full blooded siblings, as his own. That's why Granger took his last name Taylor. And I said, as I said, he as a small child, he would sit in his room and take his toys apart and put them back together. He loved just tinkering with things and just really was inquisitive as to how machines were built how f these things came together this is it's, and if you think about it guys from like a very logical perspective like i think sometimes we forget because we have the internet we have cell phones we have all these cool gadgets now but it's kind of magic right like you know if you look at everything in our world and all of a sudden we can put things together and create things like the internet like with the ether and all these things it, it is kind of magical and so I, I i could see granger kind of being interested in how this magic was created how was this happening how were we able to have these mechanical things now again he left school at 13 when he was in the eighth grade and he was hired as an apprentice at an auto shop and he stayed as an apprentice for about a year. Now, I personally think apprenticeships are amazing. I, I you know, I am I am a typical Xennial, 1983, between the generation, generation X and Millennial, which we are way overeducated and way underpaid. I think there is definitely um, value in doing apprenticeships. My father used to say it's really important to have, have a talent. You know, not just like be so academic that the only thing you can do is a corporate job or an academic job, but be able to do something like be able to cut hair or be able to work on a car or be able to fix a toilet. Like you need to have a trade, a, a talent that you can do that is outside of the world of academia. Unfortunately, I mean, I guess I kind of have a talent because after in my 30s, I went to India and study traditional yoga, as you guys know, and I do teach that now outside of, of YouTube. But, you know, that, that's valuable to be able to do something, to be able to create something with your your hands, because there's a lot out there in the world. Like I, I would be screwed. Like, I don't know how to change a tire. I don't know how to fix a toilet. I don't know how, you know, we've lost a lot of the these these necessities, these things that our ancestors just knew how to do because we've been so focused on academia. So I think it's kind of cool. I, I, not to digress, but I do think apprenticeships are really cool. But nonetheless, for about a year, Granger worked as an apprentice for an auto shop. And at this very young age of 13, 14 years old is when he developed the reputation that he could fix literally anything. 
Now, as I said, it does appear that he grew up on a farm. I've never been to Vancouver Island before, so forgive me if I'm not completely accurate in my retelling of the property. Um, I tried to look at as many pictures as I could, and really, I actually have a ton of notes about Duncan, the town, which I'm probably not even going to get into. But that was just me trying to really understand um, the environment that that Duncan, um, that Granger grew up in, to understand more of how that you know, persuaded his personality and all, all that kind of stuff. After that apprenticeship, he decided to open up his own mechanic shop on his parents' property on the farm. Now, again, he's only like 14 years old. So, of course, he's he's still living on the farm with his parents. And he continues throughout his life um, before he goes missing to live on the farm with his parents. And it's not for him lacking finances. I mean, I think sometimes we think about moving back in with our parents. It's because we're broke or we're struggling. But no, he actually made pretty good money. And he kind of became like, from what I understand, not only did he have this mechanic shop on his parents' property, but he also kind of became the caretaker of the property, kind of really working the farm and, and being kind of the sole person, I'm, I'm assuming, especially as his parents started to age, to really take care of the land. And if any of you guys own land that's a full-time job and so i, I kind of wanted to make that clear like him living with his parents has nothing to do with maybe his lack of social skills it literally he took over kind of the the proprietorship of this property in his mechanic shop he restored old farm machine and even a train that had, had been abandoned for so long that a tree had grown through it he also restored a world war ii fighter plane and one of the guys that we're going to get get into in a minute, one of Granger's friends and one of Granger's apprentices talked about this train that Granger at this point started to get this personality in the town of Duncan as being more eccentric and like people trusted him and he found this train and he restored it and he could run the train back and forth on the track and this guy, which Robert, we're going to talk about in a minute, claims in one of the podcasts that he remembers as a little kid going to the Taylor farm and riding the train with Granger. Like Granger would let the kids come on the farm and he would drive them on this train for fun and how he had like restored. Like it was kind of like this really, you know what it reminds me of? And I could be completely wrong in saying this. And I covered Howard Fensner. It was one of the first episodes I did on this channel, which I will I will put that in the description box below. Just don't judge because it was one of the first ones. But it reminds me of Howard Fenster. Howard Fenster was a Georgia artist and a preacher. And he had this like paradise gardens up in North Georgia. We used to go to it all the time when I was a kid because it was near where my dad had his lake house. And he took junk, like literal junk, and created art out of it. And we would go visit this, this garden a lot and just walk through it. It was quite incredible. I probably should go back. I mean, it's been years since I've been there. It'd be kind of fun to go back. But that's kind of what it reminded me of with, with Granger. Like this kind of this spectacle, not spectacle in a bad way, but in this entertaining way. Like it, it gave the town kind of this entertaining flavor, this guy, this caricature of himself, you know, that could create these these magical could re, re bring life back into these old um abandoned machines like the train and the fighter plane and so he ended up making a lot of money being able to do this of course there are mechanics everywhere but granger was a special kind of mechanic again i think it was his sister that called him an industrial archaeologist like he was able to take these old machines that nobody thought could be rehabilitated and rehabilitate them and get them back into working order. In fact, Granger became such an enigma in this town that people would sometimes just go by the Taylor farm just to see what Granger was working on and to just watch him work. And this is funny to me too, because this is such a small town. Like you could not do that in Atlanta. Like you could not just walk up to somebody's, you know, uh, Art, arts and crafts room and just walk in and watch like you you would get arrested for trespassing but that just that's just kind of one of the beauties of a small town is that you know the doors are unlocked and you know everybody you, you know your neighbors and so 
you can go and just walk on someone's property and just watch them work. No big deal. You, you know each other. And also, this is well before the internet, well before we had as much entertainment as we do now. And so I, I do think that this became kind of entertainment for the people of the town of Duncan. Now, as we know, as we've spoken about a lot on this channel, UFOs have been the interest of many people for a long time. But we see a, a, um, a rise in UFO fast Fascination, especially after World War II. I've covered a lot of World War II episodes, especially dealing with the occult and the Nazis use of the occult. And I do believe in my personal opinion that because of everything they were doing in World War II, there were some portals that were open. People were starting to see UFOs more. Um, we see this all over the world. People are becoming, are getting to the stage where they're more accepting of the idea globally that we're not, it. like we're not the only living life form in the universe. And I think at this point, I think it's safe to say that most people just kind of accept that there are extraterrestrial life out there. I know I just, I've always just kind of accepted it. Like for me, it's like, why wouldn't there be? Like, that's pretty narcissistic to think that we're it. You know, and I know even things like the Bible, the Quran, there's so many different uh, manuscripts and scriptures that actually do talk about extraterrestrial visitation. We look at the old Sumerians uh, sketches and obviously a lot of the Egyptian stuff. We're seeing references, references to off-worlders. But this really, again, became a huge part of our kind of subculture phenomenon after World War II. And of course, going along the decades, we then had the Art Bell show. You know, we, we it just this the people just started realizing that there is more to life than what we see in our in our material world in front of us. Well, Granger himself also became quite obsessed with extraterrestrial life. He in fact wanted to understand how these UFOs are built makes sense right like he's been able to mechanically look at trains look at planes everything here in our earth existence our earth plane and now he wants to be challenged right someone that's smart or it's constantly looking for that challenge is constantly looking for that resistance so he wanted to understand how these ufos from these off-worlders these extraterrestrials were built so in the 1970s, Granger started to build his own UFO using satellite disc that he salvaged. And once he built this UFO, he spent a lot of time just sitting in this UFO, having his own, you know, quiet time, his own meditative time in this UFO. And looking at the picture, it's kind of in my opinion, a little bit innocent because it's almost like a treehouse. <laughs> like kids will go into a treehouse. Now, of course, this is the 70s and Granger liked to smoke marijuana. Who does it? You know, and we do know that he was also experimenting with some LSD. I don't I personally don't have a problem with this. I think when these things are done uh, responsibly, they can open up um, certain brain activity that otherwise isn't open but this is going to come in later to his disappearance because there are going to be some people that believe he had brain damage from this experimentation and that's why he maybe went delusional and why he disappeared now i'm gonna make this very clear i from what i researched i don't think he did enough to cause any brain damage all right i it does not seem that he was like addicted to anything. It just seems like this was something he did periodically. And it seems like he did it for the right reasons. What do I mean by the right reasons? He was trying to understand a higher state of consciousness, which, you know, I talk about microdosing a lot. It, it That's what it's for. So it doesn't seem like this was something he did on a daily basis. For all intents and purposes, Granger was very, very responsible. Like I said, he, he, as eccentric as he was, he was literally like the proprietor of his family's farm. He kept that farm working. He made a lot of money. People trusted him. You had a project. You had a broken down tractor or a banged up car. You took it to Granger. So if, if, if you were concerned that somebody was, you know, acting reckless with these extracurricular substances, you probably wouldn't trust Granger with your stuff. Right. So so this is ridiculous to me. Right. It's totally ridiculous. Obviously, it was not a problem. Granger also had a dog named Lady that he absolutely adored and loved. And when you have 
a soul, whether that is a four-legged soul or a two-legged soul that's super dependent upon you. And we know that four-legged souls are absolutely dependent upon us. Typically, and I know there's there's exceptions to the rules, you are going to maintain some sense of, of security within yourself, if not for you, but for to take care of that, especially that helpless animal. And again, I know there are many cases where people get their kids taken away from them and animals get abused. I, I, I understand that. But from Granger, from the story I, I hear about Granger, he loved his dog lady so much. I don't think there was anything he would have done to compromise his ability to take care of Lady, his dog. Now, there's no mention of Ranger ever having a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I don't think he he was, was gay. I don't have a whatever if he was. But just looking at pictures, I get the very, maybe even an asexual vibe. I, I don't know. I mean, and if you know more about this case and you know more about any romantic relationships Granger had, Please let me know. But it, it doesn't really matter. But I'm just kind of bringing this up because Lady, his dog Lady, was like his whole world. There was no other romantic partner. You know, he didn't have children. This dog was his 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 heart. I get that. My dog, who is sitting on the bed right now, scratching himself, <laughs> you can probably hear it, is my whole world and my whole heart. There was nothing to interfere with his relationship with the dog and taking care of the dog, which is going to make his disappearance even stranger. Now, during these times where he would go and sit in his spaceship, he started to believe that he was telepathically receiving messages from extraterrestrials. Now, I do know that there are people, especially on Telegram, that believe that they are receiving telepathic messages from extraterrestrials, and I don't believe them. I think they're wishful thinking, and I think sometimes people get very, very confused between their intuition and wishful thinking, their imagination and their intuition. There's not a lot of discernment nowadays as to thoughts that we're having. And so most of the people that I see on Telegram and that I see on the YouTube who claim to talk to extraterrestrials, I don't believe them. I think they're full of crap. Um, but with Granger, I actually kind of believe him because the way that he spoke about his communication, his telepathy with these extraterrestrials, there was no ego involved in it. And it was literally messages about using his intelligence to help them. But, I, but there was no ego, right? It was just very matter of fact. Um, I don't think that Granger was an egotistical man anyway. He see, Even though he was eccentric and shy, he was very kind. And I do feel like if we're looking at the law of one, I do feel like he was definitely a service to others individual. He had, Granger had nothing to prove, right? So him saying that he was telepathically speaking to off-worlders, he was already kind of a town celebrity, even though there was no ego there. He already was kind of an enigma. He already had a very stable life. He had parents and a family that loved him, a dog he adored, friends. It doesn't seem like he was the type of person that wanted to go gallivanting around the world to all the big cities. He seemed very, very happy with his life. In fact, he was a man of habit. He seemed to do the same things every single day, including eating kind of the same foods and going to the same establishments. He was, he was very much in, on his own schedule, but, which is very very, very interesting with the autism thing because that's something that autistic people, I mean, I like being on a schedule too, but I can deviate. But people who have autism or on that spectrum do tend to want to be on a schedule. Granger was also known to be extremely honest, which again is another symptom of, in my opinion, autism. Now, being extremely honest and being a truthful person are two totally different things. When you are a truthful person, you might not say everything you're thinking, right? But when we look when we look at people who are on the spectrum, sometimes they will just say everything they're thinking and they never lie. They're, they're very, very, very honest. I mean, we look at the Gypsy Road Rose Blanter case, I and mean, that's the thing that happened with her co-conspirator. Nicholas um, Dodajan, if you missed that story, I'm sure you are very well aware of that story, but if I'll put that down in the description box too, just in case you missed it. They will, to a fault, tell you the truth. 
And so that was kind of from my perception, Granger's personality to a fault. He would tell you the truth and he never lied. Autistic people or people in the spectrum don't really know how to lie from my perception. Um, and that can be a good thing and it can also be a bad thing. And so the fact that Granger started saying, hey, like I'm, I'm communicating with these extraterrestrials. I've been working on these space ships, trying to figure out how their spaceships work and and they're kind of communicating with me people just kind of took him seriously because he didn't lie he wasn't somebody who lied sorry guys my boyfriend got home from work so i had to pause it for a moment just to go say hello to him but where were we we were talking about granger and the aliens so again granger had this reputation of being like brutally honest and he had nothing to prove he there was nothing, definitely was not a man that gave off any type of manipulation type vibes. Just very much Granger is who he is. He's shy. He's introverted. He's eccentric. He's kind. He's super, super smart. And so people in the town, when he started speaking in the 70s, when he started speaking about these communications he was having with these ETs, it seems that most people just kind of believed him. Like, why would he lie? He had no reason to lie about this. Robert Keller is the person that I re referenced earlier. And he was younger than Granger. He apprenticed under Granger. Now, Robert Keller is also a, a Duncan resident. And um, he was a teenager when he became a good friend with Granger. I, nothing nefarious there. I know people in the comment sections are going to start to question that. Absolutely nothing nefarious there. Um now, again, he claims he met Granger when he was about seven years old because his dad used to take him over to the Taylor farm so that Robert could ride the train with the other kids that Granger had restored. Now, when Robert became a teenager, he became a little bit wild. And you, you can listen to these podcasts and hear Robert. They, they always interview Robert. And Robert kind of tells his own story about his teenage years. Now, Robert claims that Granger saved him because Robert also dropped out of school in the eighth grade. Now, unlike Granger, Robert was not a genius. I mean, no offense. I'm not the level of, of intelligence that Gr Granger was a class of his own when it came to his intelligence. So none of us, I think it's safe to say that none of us had the same intelligence level that Granger Taylor had. And when Robert dropped out of school in the eighth grade, it's a small town, Granger, Granger knew. And Granger came over, from what I understand, to the Keller house and was speaking with um, Robert's father. And, and Granger was like, well, I, I left school in the eighth grade, too. And Granger and, and Robert's father was like, well, Granger, you're smart. You know, you had a, a life path. You had things that you could do. Robert is just a wild child who's left school. And so Granger said, no, Robert, I'm going to come by every morning and pick you up at eight o'clock and you're going to come apprentice with me. So that's why Robert basically stated that Granger saved his life. And one of the podcasts, Rod, Robert stated that if Granger had not intervened and, and started getting Robert to come to his shop with him and apprentice under him as as a 13, 14 year old kid, he might have ended up in jail or dead because that's where his life was going. But Granger gave him a schedule. And Granger, it, it seems like too, I think sometimes when kids go wild like that, there's a lack of self aware of, of self appreciation of, of value, you know, and the school system is really good at making people feel really shitty, right? But Granger, it seems like Granger, like, honed in on Robert. Like, no, you're a human being, and you you can learn a trade. You can come with me. I left school eighth grade. I'll teach you what what I have, I, I, I know. And, and that's just kind of what it sounded like to me. Again, this could be me just interpreting it completely wrong. But I know, do know there was nothing nefarious there. It was literally Granger stepping in and saying, I'm going to give you a life path. I'm going to give you a schedule. I'm going to, I'm going to apprentice you. And so... At that point, at every morning at 8 o'clock, Granger would come pick Robert up. And Robert would spend all day with Granger apprenticing under him. And so Robert and Granger ended up becoming really close. Really, really, he, Ro Granger was a confidant for Robert. And I do think, in, in my personal opinion, because um, Granger lacks, lacks certain social skills, that perhaps on a social level, Granger was probably more at Robert's level anyway than vice versa. 
um, because socially he was very awkward. And so maybe he got along better with 13, 14 year old kids. You know, he, I think it just seems like there was a part of Granger that was still really innocent, that still kind of liked the toys and, and had a very innocent perception of the world, you know? And so I think that that childlike view of the world, even though he was a savant when it came to mechanics, so therefore, I think Robert and him did get very closer probably than most adults and teenagers would get in a, in a very innocent way. Like, again, nothing nefarious. It was a very innocent, innocent friendship. And again, Robert still to this day claims that Granger saved his life. So in 1980, um, Granger started to tell Robert that these aliens that he was having telepathic communication with were actually going to come and pick him up. That apparently the extraterrestrials needed Granger for his intellect. And they were going to take Granger on a 42-month universe tour, like world tour, but universe tour on the spaceship. And they would bring Granger back after 42 months. Granger told Robert again that the aliens needed Granger for his mind, but he would be back. Now, Robert started claiming that he wanted to go with Granger. Robert absolutely believed Granger. And listening to him today on the podcast as a grown man, I think he still believes Granger. And frankly, I want to believe Granger too, which we're going to get to at the end of this episode, all the different theories. But Granger told Robert that 42 months in the ether and space-time is not the same as 42 months here on the Earth plane. That 42 months in the ether and the space-time is about 150 years on the Earth plane. Granger told Robert that Robert had too much to live for. That Robert was a young man. And that even though when Granger came back after the 42 months in space time, he would only be 42 months older, everyone on planet Earth would be 150 years early or older. So everyone on Earth would be 150 years older. So therefore dead. He told Robert that Robert had a whole future ahead of him. He had a wife coming at some point, potentially children, grandchildren. And Granger did not want Robert to miss out on that. He wanted Robert to have a life. This to me is so touching. Granger obviously knew, even though he was super smart, he obviously knew that his life was very, very different from most people. Again, he had multiple siblings. He wasn't married. He had a very different social perception of the world around him than most people. For Granger to now be able to be picked up by a spaceship and taken on this 42 months extravaganza of seeing the universe and helping the aliens, this was like the best thing that ever happened to Granger. But he understood that for Robert, there were things that were going to top that, getting married, having children. And these things, these life events that Robert was a store for Robert were not in the cards for Granger. So sadly, he told Robert that he would make sure, though, when he came back after the 42 months in the ether, he would come back to visit Robert. Robert, at that young age, understood that Granger meant he would be visiting Robert's tombstone. Robert's grandkids, great-grandchildren, because 150 years, he would no longer be here in the physical body. Granger told Robert that the aliens were going to come pick him up on a night of a horrific storm. That the aliens needed to use the sound and the, the gray clouds of the storm to cover as a cover, like to cover their, their ship, to cover the sounds of the ship. And so that was when he would be picked up. And on November 29th, they woke up to some rain. And Granger told Robert that, that that was the night that the aliens were going to come get him. Robert was a little bit confused by this because living in the northwestern Pacific side of, of the United, American continent, it, like Seattle, it's, it's rainy a lot. It's overcast a lot. 
the, the the rain they woke up to on November 9th was nothing like the thunderstorm that Granger spoke about when he claimed there would be a huge storm that would cover the ship to pick him up. But Granger assured Robert that the aliens had told them him that by the end of the day, it was going to be a huge thunderstorm. And Robert didn't really believe him, but as the day went on, the weather started to change and started to become super dangerous outside. In fact, according to Robert, now the meteorologist referred to the night of November 29th as the storm of the century. There was no way that Granger would have known just by himself, that the drizzle that they experienced on the morning of the November 29th, which was normal for the area, would turn into the storm it turned into. There was no way for him to know that. No way, especially in 1980. He was not a meteorologist. This was not his level of expertise, watching weather patterns. Even the me meteorologist at the time didn't understand the storm that was rolling in until it actually started to roll in. So this is a huge mystery still to this day to, to Robert and other people. Like, how did Granger know that? And again, it does seem that Robert does believe that Granger was being told this information by extraterrestrials. So Granger also drove a, as Robert describes it, a, a Pepto-Bismol pink-colored truck. And Robert even explains that Robert helped Granger paint the truck, this Pepto-Bismol pink. It was very much a truck that people, that, that fit Granger's eccentric personality and, and people saw around town. And at 6 p.m. the night of the 29th, Granger drove his Pepto-Bismol pink truck to Bob's Grill in Duncan and had his dinner. Later on, after he was done with his dinner, he went back to one more time to say goodbye to Robert. As Granger left the Keller's property, Robert claims that he saw Granger driving off in his pink pickup, never to be seen again. Now, the next morning, there was a letter that Granger left on his parents' bedroom door. Now, his mother at that time was on a vacation in Hawaii. And so her the, the stepfather, Jim, was the one to actually see the letter first. And I'm going to read you the letter. Dear mother and father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship. As reoccurring dreams assured a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe and return. I am leaving behind all my possessions to you as I will no longer require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. Now, his will, he had changed some words in his will. For example, he changed the word um, deceased to departed. He also insisted that there be no funeral because he was not dead. He instructed them to take care of his dog, Lady, and how to take care of his dog, Lady, and then left and was never seen again. As word spread that Granger had in fact left, the whole town beha became quite invested in his story. Again, most people in the town knew Granger was not a liar. They believed that he was talking telepathically to extraterrestrials and they were invested in his return in 42 months. But it was really only Robert Keller, the young boy, that knew, because Granger told him, that 42 months in the astro, in the ether, is not the same as 42 months on Earth. Nonetheless, after 42 months had passed on Earth, everybody in town was eagerly awaiting Granger's return. Robert Keller, in an interview, even mentions that it was almost like they were planning to have some big parade when he reappeared. But sadly, after 42 months here on the Earth, nothing happened. He didn't come back. Again, Robert Keller knew why. Robert Keller knew that 42 months on Earth was not the same as 42 months with the aliens. At this point, the RCMP, or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, hope I said that right, I'm not Canadian, got involved in this case. Now, the, the RCMP is the exact same as the three-letter agency that I cannot say on YouTube that starts with an F and ends with an I. 
for Canada. So this is a serious police force. Like this is not some podunk small town police force. This is like the government's police force. And so they start to get involved in the investigation into Granger. And this is when things start to get weird. Because on March of 1986, three years after Granger disappeared, the RCMP claimed to have found remains of Granger's truck. So let's get into what they found, because this gets very interesting. So news reports claim they found the truck on Mount Prevo. I hope I'm saying that right. It's it's an interesting mountain, you guys. If you want me to do a cover-up of different things that have happened on this mountain, just let me know, because I did look a little bit into this mountain, as I typically do. There's some interesting supernatural things associated with this mountain, to, to say the least. So Prevo, Mount Pre Prevo, this is a mountain northwestern of... This is a mountain northwest of Duncan on Vancouver Island. Um, and in fact, on the top of the mountain is a, a memorial to a war. I mean, there's some really fascinating stories surrounding this mountain. So again, if you want me to cover this mountain, let me know in the comment section below and I will do a deep dive into all the supernatural occurrences around this mountain. Now, they set, claim that workmen, so the RCMP claimed that workmen doing their workmen stuff on the mountain found a blast site with pieces of truck in a crater. Now, apparently this mountain too, like many mountains, especially many mountains with supernatural origins and mysteries, it's kind of like the Appalachian Mountains that I've spoken about a lot, especially over on Gnostic TV, if you're following my extra... Um, at, let me do that again, especially over on Gnostic TV. If you are following my Esoteric Explorer series over there, we've talked a lot about Appalachia. And so it kind of sounds like the same, but on the other side of the country where people can go missing here, people can disappear here. Like there's a lot of times like people get lost on this mountain and they're never seen again. And so the fact that there were pieces of this truck found on this mountain is actually quite kind of a miracle, too. Now, it was such a disaster, this blast site, that um, you couldn't really see that it was Granger's car. But according to the RCMP, they found a part of the truck that had the VIN number. And when they checked the VIN number, it came back as Granger's truck. Now, Robert is very skeptical of this. Um, he's very skeptical of this. And because they, they say that the VIN number, that the report claims the truck was blue, not pink. Now, there was a reporter that was investigating this, and he said it could be that uh, when you're registering a VIN number, you register a certain color to the car, and blue could have been one of the colors at one point for the truck. Doesn't mean that they could actually see the color of the truck. It had been three years. It was a blast site. The likelihood of there being any color visible at all would have been slim. And so they probably got the blue color of the truck from the registration of the VIN number and not from the, the, the truck itself. So that makes sense to me. However, just because you found a truck doesn't mean that you found a body. When we were listening to this podcast in the car <laughs> coming down, my boyfriend laughed and he goes, it just kind of sounds like the aliens picked Granger up in his car and then spit the car out and blast it, which was kind of my, my thought too. Like he doesn't need his car in the Astro. And so maybe like the UFO just kind of like spat, spat the car out and that's just how it ended up. We also know that it, it, it obviously, and I say like it kind of like maybe they, la they lasered it or something because obviously dynamite was used. Now, Granger was proficient with dynamite. He used dynamite a lot when he was doing uh, pulling up old mechanics out in the forest like the train, right? So he was, he knew how to work with dynamite. And um, Robert very cleverly after the RCMP claimed that dynamite was lit to blow up the truck, he went over to the Taylor farm and looked in Granger's uh, workspace and all of Granger's dynamite was accounted for in the workspace. Well, you could think, oh, well, maybe he just went and bought some and they didn't know he had bought dynamite, but dynamite is like a lot of weapons when you buy it, they register that you've bought it. Like they know who ha who owns dynamite and who doesn't. And there was no record of Granger buying or anyone that resembled Granger buying dynamite prior to November 29th. That wasn't accounted for. Like everything Granger had, pur had purchased 
for his work was accounted for in the shop. That's strange to me too. I believe Robert when he says this, it's not, it's just not adding up, my friend. It's not adding up. It's not adding up. Now the blast site itself was a 200 to 300 foot radius. Truck parts went as far as 60 feet up. Many experts who know how this works says this is this isn't right. This is not right. It's it's too big for a normal blast. Like this is not human. Whatever happened to this truck, it's not normal. Which goes back to my boyfriend's theory that they just kind of spit the truck out, zapped it because this is not what a normal blast would do. The RCMP found clove uh, found some clothing that a family member said was Granger's, but the family said that they were never asked to ID clothing. So the RCMP is lying. They're lying and saying that the family has identified some of the clothing as Granger's, but the family's like, no one spoke to us about any clothing ever. And Robert brings up a good point. How the hell, if the color of the truck can't be determined at the wreckage site, how is clothing still there? How has clothing still survived these three years in this forest after being blasted? You mean to tell me a wool sweater is going to survive and pieces of a human body, an intact human body or a truck aren't? Listen to the governments around the world. We're not as dumb as you think we are. Obviously. I mean, look how much we've woken up these past four years. It must really piss you guys off. Sucks to be you, but we're not stupid. I know common sense ain't that common, but a lot of people do have common sense. And shit is not adding up. They also said they found human, some human remains. Not a lot. But they cannot DNA test it. They can't even determine if the remains that they found are male or female. But the coroner went ahead and just said it was Granger's. I thought science was about not making any type of, of factual statement until you have every investigation done, until you know factually. So why was the coroner just signing it off as Granger's without there being any DNA testing. You could ask, well, now, in 1986, maybe the DNA testing wasn't that great, but it's 2024, so why don't we just go and have the remains tested now? Because surely now, our technology has changed so much that it would be better. You would think. You would think. But guess what, you guys? The RCMP lost the evidence. They lost the evidence. They lost the evidence. Shucks. You know, shucks. We could now go and test all these things to have a definitive answer. But shucks, y'all. We lost the evidence. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So Robert, as well as many other people, believe that this is a massive cover-up. That Granger has been taken on an extraterrestrial escapade across the galaxy. Reminds me of that train song, you know, from like the or I can't sing it because I'll get I'll get zapped on on YouTube for a copyright stri strike about going across the Milky Way. You know, he's out there. And the government's trying to cover it up. They don't want people to know that Granger actually had communication with off-worlders because we know governments across the world have tried to cover this up for a very long time. In fact, just recently, the United States government actually admitted, y'all been right this whole time. There are extraterrestrials, but we know we've been right this whole time, so no one fucking cared <laughs> because, duh, we know that. We also think, or there is theories, that Granger was actually taken by the government, that he was taken either by the Canadian government or the United States government or Canadian conjunction with the United States government to hold him for his abilities, kind of like what they did with Operation Paperclip, but Granger was a good guy, not a bad guy, and Granger just thought, mistakenly thought, it was extraterrestrial. Some people think that Granger ran off to Columbia, that he started a whole new life in Columbia. I don't believe this. I know he had friends in Columbia, but his life was fine. He was happy. 
I don't think he would have left his dog behind just to go to Columbia. Now, of course, if he is on his little escapade across the galaxy, across the Milky Way, we'll never know. Because by the time Granger comes back, none of us will be here. So if that is in fact what happened to Granger, it will be our grandchildren, our grandchildren's children, who finally get the answer to this unsolved mystery. Now, again, I do kind of think that he is somewhere in the astro right now, traveling around with the extraterrestrials. I do believe that. Maybe that's because I want to believe that. But I also can play devil's advocate and could say maybe he did go into a form of psychosis. And maybe even though he's honest, he truly believed he was hearing these voices, but these voices weren't really there. And maybe an accident happened. Maybe he drove over dynamite. I, I don't know. Could he be abducted by the government and being used behind the scenes, kind of held captive by the government at this point? Probably. That, that could be a possibility. Or again, is he just out flying around the Milky Way, seeing all that there is to see about the great unknown? That is what I want to believe. What do you guys think? And for my Canadian friends, let me know. I know that there's some museum now that holds a lot of Granger's um, stuff, like his the stuff he he um, restored, like the plane and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm not sure, exactly sure. I've been trying to find it. Like I've been trying to Google like where are Granger's uh things and, and that i can't on google and the united states is not pulling up for me I, I probably just need to change my vip number or whatever it's called to go to canada to see if i can find it but it's not pulling up for me here in the united states so if you are from canada and you know the the museum that's holding some of Gran granger stuff let me know or let us know down in the comment section below or in the live chat that's happening right now so so we can kind of especially people in Canada, if they want to go see it, they can go see it. And yeah, please let me know what you guys think. Like wild story, huh? Like, I mean, wild story, wild story. So let me know. I do not think he unalived himself. I really don't. He loved his dog too much. He absolutely loved his dog too much. There's no way he would have done that. So, so let me know. What do you guys think? All right, you guys. Well, I hope you're having a wonderful week and we'll talk very soon. Bye everybody.